Well, good morning, Victory family. You guys ready to worship? All right, let's get on our feet. Want to read a scripture? These altars are open if you need to get in a place for God to speak to you this morning. Come out of your seats, get right around these altars. You don't have to wait until part of the service when we have you come forward for prayer. God's going to move this morning. Amen? The psalmist writes in Psalm 20, he says, May the Lord answer you in the day of your trouble. May the name of God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. How many of you need support this morning? How many of you need support physically? How many of you need support emotionally? How many of you need support financially? Amen. The Lord is a help. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all of your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. He remembers every prayer. Every time you've gotten on your knees and you've prayed to God for something, you've sacrificed time to be with God, he remembers that and he uses it. Amen? Let's lift our hands across the sanctuary as we go to the Lord in prayer and welcome him in this sanctuary. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for what you're about to do. We thank you this morning for the atmosphere that you have prepared already. We know that you're going to move this morning. And so we ask you, Holy Spirit, open up our hearts. Soften our hearts this morning. Remove our heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh so that we can sense your presence. God, we know that you are everywhere. We know that your presence is everywhere. But this morning we are praying for your manifest, tangible presence to be evident in this sanctuary right now. For those who are joining us in their live streams, God, we pray for your presence to be in their homes, in their cars, in their workplaces. God, we know that you can move even outside of these walls. And so we ask you, Holy Spirit, have your way this morning as we worship you. You are worthy of our praise, oh God. You are worthy of our praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's worship this morning.
sing that song again and I'd like to just encourage you with a thought and then I want you to just come and, and just press in and just declare that promise what we know to be true when my wife and I have faced trials whatever way they've come life ministry family whatever when we were kind of maybe surprised by something, you know, something we, we learned to just say and kind of just stuck with us is nothing, nothing's changed. What I mean by that or what we meant by that is it didn't surprise God. And he still has a plan and he still has a purpose. He still has a miracle. He still has a way out. So nothing's changed, although it might have surprised us although it might have been overwhelming God is still God he's still on the throne nothing could hinder what he's doing we just believe him through it and matter of fact most times all of the times that we respond by faith and, and persevere the very things that surprise us or overwhelm us the very trials become our stepping stone to something more and something greater thank you for that weak amen this morning but hopefully by the end you'll get it amen Turn to the person next to you say, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. What we mean by that are the spiritual truths. What we mean by that is God is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. What we mean by that is his word is settled in heaven forever. Nothing's changed. God is still God. He's still on the throne. His word still works in our life. So would you lift your hands this morning all over this place? We're going to sing that song again. But would you activate your faith? Would you focus? Focus, focus. Come on, some of you need the Holy Spirit to help you to focus this morning. Come on, focus on God. Focus on His Word. Focus on what's true this morning. We break off every lying spirit, every hindering spirit, everything in our minds and in our hearts that would be contrary to the Word and the will of God. We thank you today, God, that you are bigger, you are greater. You might, you're so much stronger than any giant, than any trial, than anything that's come against us. Lord, today, let there be victories in the house of God. Let there be victories in victory this morning. Let there be breakthroughs. Let there be anointings, God, over our hearts and our minds that bring us through, that bring us to another level this morning. God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that nothing's changed, God. You're still God. You're still on the throne. You're still working all things according to your will. 
We thank you for that today, God. Let faith arise in your people. Come on, let faith arise this morning. In Jesus' name. Come on, move out of your seats. Come on, get to a place of worship, a place of pressing in this morning, a place of believing God for what you're going through. Don't sit still. Don't stay where you're at. Let's believe God this morning that he is greater. He is working by his power, by his spirit this morning. Amen. Let's sing it. Let's sing it triumphantly. Let's sing it in faith and declare it this morning. Oh, my God. 
This is a house of worship. This is a place of praise. Where every demon trembles. Where we proclaim your name. This is a house of healing. Our hearts are full of faith. You have a full attention. You have the every need and this is a critical this is a crucial moment in the church Jesus said my house should be a house of prayer we want to be a house of prayer amen we want to be a people of prayer 
So everyone, it's simple. We could all talk to God. We could all just speak to him just from your heart. Just begin to pray all over this place, calling upon the name of the Lord in a place that we believe we have an open heaven because we have prayed and prayed and prayed and fasted and believed for God to work in this place. So we thank you, God. We praise you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on all over this place, just seeking the Lord, just trusting him, just praying right now, right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that this is a house of miracles, God. Thank you, God, that you love every one of us unconditionally. Lord, your grace, your mercy are always extended to us. God, even in our hearts, work in us this morning to turn towards you, to turn to you with all of our heart, with all of our being, oh God. Lord, forgive our sins today, God. Deliver us from all evil today, God. Lord, quicken us by the power of the Holy Spirit this morning, Lord. Oh, God, let the anointing of your presence, the anointing oil, let it be that your breaking uh, uh, anointing that destroys that uh, the oppressiveness and the, and the things that the world, the enemy, people would try to put on us, Father. God, we thank you today that this is a house of prayer. We are a people who call upon the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, cry out to God. I know some of you have some great needs. Come on, if you have a great need, cry out to the Lord greatly this morning. Come on, he hears. Come on, prayer works. Prayer works. Men ought always to pray and never faint. We pray, we seek, we call upon the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, flow in this place. Quicken every life. Touch every heart. Lord, let the presence, the anointing of your spirit minister to every need, Lord. God, we seek you in this place. We've come together under the authority of the name of Jesus. Jesus, you've come to destroy the works of the devil. You've come to put the enemy to flight. And Lord, we call on you tonight. Let your kingdom come today. It's not about us. It's not about victory. It's about the kingdom of God. Oh God, let the kingdom of God come with power this morning. Let the kingdom of God be manifested among us with healings, with deliverances, with salvations, with life change, with victories, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for every life. We thank you for every person. We thank you, God. God, for healing virtue over sick bodies in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, for oppression and op depression to be broken off. Let the joy of the Lord be our strength. Let the peace of God be our portion. Let the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us. The love of God with us today, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, just take a few moments to give God praise. Come on, I know you are people of praise. You're people of worship. Don't get hung up in your thoughts this morning. Don't be affected by the paralysis of analysis, trying to figure it out. Just give God praise and thanksgiving this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We lift up our voice to praise and honor the name of the Lord. We give glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 We give praise to you. We give honor to you, Lord. You are worthy, Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give him a shout. Give him a praise. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let everything that hath breath praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. In everything give thanks. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for every person here. Thank you, Lord, for every life, God. Touch every life. Touch every family, God. We do business with you this morning. We do spiritual warfare against the attacks of the enemy. 
Oh God, we believe for a standard to be raised up against the enemy this morning in this place, in every life, in every family. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We enter into your gates with thanksgiving. We enter into your courts with praise, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. God, I just pray the peace of God that passes all understanding would guard and keep our hearts and our minds this morning. Oh God, speak peace. Speak your shalom over your people, God, over the body of Christ, the people of God. Lord, if there are any that do not know you this morning in a personal way, they've never put their faith in Jesus, never repented of their sin, oh God, touch their hearts today. Let them know they can only find peace in Jesus, only peace through the cross, through the blood. Oh God, let them know that there is hope. Let them know that there is forgiveness this morning. Let their faith, God, come alive. Let them have a hope to look to you, to look to Jesus and to live. We thank you for every life, every family. We believe you today for good things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen, Amen. Take a moment to greet someone. Be friendly. Smile at them. Smiling is an international language. something to celebrate, don't we? Yes, Jesus Amen. came for us, right? Yes, he did. Yes, He's yes, with yes. us. Absolutely. So we want to welcome, if this is your first time here at Victory Church, can we give a nice loud welcome to our first time back? Those tuning in on our live stream, that shout was for you too. We want to welcome you. We're so honored that you took time to be here with us. You're not here by accident. God knew that you were going to be here. God has something for you. So and we have something for you. It's called the connection card. Oh, yeah. So right in the seat pockets in front of you. So if you wouldn't mind filling those out. If you've also been coming the past few months and have not filled one out, we would love for you to fill one of those out. If those things help us pray with you, helps to connect you with people, as well as to connect you with what's happening here in the life of the church. Once you fill it out, if it is your first time, you can bring it to the Welcome Center following service, and we have a really cool gift that we want to give to you. Amen? Amen. Those who are on our live stream, on our website at victorychurchri.com, we have digital connection cards right at the top right-hand corner. You can fill one of those out. We'll be able to call, connect with you, pray with you, anything, any needs that you have. Amen? Amen. Also want to remind you, the church app. I've had a lot of people lately coming up to me for help with the church app, which is good. That means you're using it. And so we want to encourage you, if you have not yet downloaded that on your phone, that's just a great way to digitally connect and see what's happening. Great reminders of the events that are taking place here, signing up for classes, registering for events. If you have an Android or iPhone, you can go to our website. And we have two buttons. You just give those buttons a tap. It'll take you right to the store where you can download it. You can also give through that platform. A few events that are coming up. We want to give an update from last week's event. We want to first thank everyone who stopped. How many of you ate all the cookies that you bought? Last week from the beginning, no one wants to admit it. Got a few hands, a few honest people. But we want to thank you for investing into yes. the BGMC, the Boys and Girls Missionary Challenge. Kelly, you did an awesome job with your team. It was so awesome to see the kids yes. serve it. My girls were so taking it so seriously. They, just, they love being a part of it. And so they raised three hundred dollars. Just cooking. 
not going to go towards that, and so we want to thank you for being a part of that. As you saw, we have a table in the foyer, the emerging leaders. How many of you had the, took the class just recently? Wasn't it awesome? Did yeah. you guys have a challenge? Yeah, yeah. But you came deeper, right, with a relationship with people. And so we have another class that's going to be starting. You can sign up right in the foyer. It's going to be on eschatology, biblical teaching on the last days and last things that are going to be happening. If you want more information, you can stop at that table as well. We also have Emerge Night, which is coming this Friday, December 15th. It's going to be right here at Victory Church. This is just youth groups from all over are going to come, and we're going to worship God. We're going to press in. It's a great time to worship. We've got some games planned, but God's going to move. God is moving at these things. So parents, I'm going to encourage you to bring your teens. God is going to show up. We also have a new decoration that will be on the back wall. We have our new cross that is on the wall, which is awesome. I did not put a picture behind me because on your way out, just pop in and take a look because the pictures do not do it justice. But I want to thank uh, Tony Oliver, who he owns a wood shop in Summers, Connecticut, and he made us a cross for our youth room. And he loves what we're doing with the church. We just shared with him the vision. And when we, uh, Caleb and I actually went to uh, pick it up a few weeks ago, and he said, he, basically, I'm going to give this to you. I'm going to donate it to your youth oh, room. And wow. he gave awesome. all the lumber, all of the screws, the bolts, everything to put it together. And then Dion, I saw you, where's he? He was over here Friday helping uh, put that thing together. Man, we put the cross beams on. It took both of us to lift that thing, but it is up, and it, we can say the youth is officially finished. And so I'm just excited that we're going to have that up again for the Merge Night. But we know that the cross is only a symbol. You know, spirit of religion will say, you need a cross. But a relationship will say, that's awesome that we got a cross. And so it's up there as a reminder. Amen? Well, two other things, quick, and then Pastor Lisa is going to come up and share an exciting event. Christmas service is December 24th, and so we want this place packed. God is going to move. There's a message of hope. We are praying for your families in this season. We have postcards, so please, just in the next couple weeks, be praying for us as a staff. Be praying for the Spirit of God to move. Be inviting people. Our kids' uh, ministry is going to be doing the choir, which I can't wait to hear. And we have so many other things that are going to bless you on that Christmas service. And then New Year's, the following Sunday, December 31st, we're going to have a special New Year's Eve service, 11 p.m., yes, p.m., for those of you who are newer, here at the church, and we're going to praise and worship and bring in the new year with prayer. Amen? Amen. Let's welcome Pastor Lisa as she comes with another exciting event this week. So, we have our very first year of what we're calling a Christmas Ritz Blitz, and I want to tell you... We have nine boxes of 18 stacks of Ritz. <laughs> we have 18 jars of giant jars of peanut butter. We have 100 bags of chocolate. And we need you. Yeah. This is an event that we are having for the Teen Challenge girls. I have done this many times in the past with them. We haven't done it for a few years. But we're doing it again this year right in the cafe. The cost is only $10. It is an evening for you to come and encourage these girls. Amen. Christmas can often be a very, very difficult time for the residents of the Teen Challenge homes. Yeah. And so we are having the girls come. We are making rich cookies. Now, you might think that sounds very boring. Well, if you know anything about dunked chocolate melted chocolate, you could put tree bark in this and it would taste good. <laughs> so we take Ritz and we make peanut butter Ritz sandwiches and we dunk them in this chocolate. And we are going to be having these girls make packages for their families yes, as yes. gifts to give to their families. Oh, yes. And also you will get a little bundle to take home yourself. But the whole premise of this event is to come and be a blessing. Yes. These girls have come out of situations that are very difficult. They're not with their children. They're not with their spouses. But when the people come to visit them, their parents, maybe their kids, maybe their spouses, whoever it is that comes, they're going to have gifts to give them That's because awesome. they wouldn't otherwise. Awesome. So Amen. please Amen. come out to encourage these women. We're going to have good conversation with them. Your life can bless these women. Yes. Just give a listening ear and a, and a word of encouragement to them as you're dunking. We have one rule. It's, we have a lot of rules for this evening, but the one, one, the one main rule is no licking your fingers. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So please come out. Register on the church app. Today is the last day to do that. So thank you. Come Amen. help us dunk. Amen. Love you guys. Lawrence, if you would come and take our offering this morning.
Praise God this morning. Amen. 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 Who's ready to give? So, a few years ago, there was a, a survey done to many, many churches throughout the country. And the numbers revealed that four out of ten church attendees give nothing at all. And another two or three out of the ten give next to nothing at all. Wow. And so those are shocking numbers. I look, I look at that and I said, this can't be victory. This come is on. not us. I see how many people come and give. Come on, amen. You know, now, as we look at scripture, we see other times when these numbers were equally as bad or if not worse. And so I just want to focus on God's response to one of these times. Um, if you have your Bibles, please turn to me to Malachi 3, 8, please. Malachi 3, 8. So in Malachi's time, Malachi was a prophet of God. The people in those days forgot all about what it meant to tithe. They started to keep every single dollar they had in their pockets. Every time they went to work, they just cared about themselves, looked to themselves and their family members. And so God saw that and God said, wait, hold on. God sent the message through Malachi to the people. And so I want to read that to you today. I'll, I'll read slowly. So God said to the people, Will a man rob God? Hmm. Yes, you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me. Even this whole nation. Now here's where we see God's goodness and mercy. In verse 10, he says, Bring all your tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out to you such blessings that there will not be room enough to Amen. receive it. Amen. This was God's response to a people who held every single thing to themselves. God said, I am your provider. Trust in me and see how I will bless you. And so today, as we prepare our tithes and offerings, let's remember that this same promise echoes out to us today. Amen. God always tells us that I'm the one who provides all your needs, your children, I'm the one who gave them to you. Your houses, guess who gave them to That's you? Right. Your That's wonderful right. job, it's me. Right. And so remember me when you're given. Amen. And I will remember to bless you. Yes. Let's all stand this morning. Thank you, Lord. See, as I, as I started looking at these numbers, I remember the days when I used to, to only be able to give $5 out of my pocket. But when I took that $5 and I gave, I, I spoke to the Lord. I said, Lord, help me to give double, please. And the Lord was always faithful. He helped me to double it to $10. I saw the $10 and I said, Lord, help me to double it. <laughs> and he helped me. He doubled it to 20 and So I said, I might as well keep going. Lord, help me to double it. He doubled it to 40 I said, Lord, help me to double it. He doubled it to 80 and I kept going. Help me to double it. Amen. 160. Woo. I'm going to stop there. Right? Yeah. Let's trust the Lord this morning. Yeah. Whether it's a dollar, it's five dollars, like the way I started with, or a hundred dollars, it's He who provides. Amen. And so let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you yes. for your goodness and mercy in our lives, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you Lord God, for continuing to remind us, Lord of who is king in our lives, Father, who blesses us so we may in turn bless others, Lord. Father, please forgive us, Lord God, for forgetting this from time to time, Lord God, and we thank you for letting your spirit continue to convict us and to help us, Lord, to stay onto the path of righteousness, Lord. Lord, with the tough times that we're facing, Lord, we know, Father, that there is nothing too small and nothing too big for you, Lord, and so we'll continue to trust in you. Father, we thank you Please accept our blessings today. Accept our offering, Lord. And Father, Lord, please, Lord, please soften our hearts and remind us on an ongoing basis, Lord, to just keep you first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We have four ways to give up on the screen, and so you can go ahead and come and give to the Lord. Thank you for your giving this morning.
Psalm 139, 1-2 says, tells us Jesus always knows what you are going through and he always knows the right course of action. Ask him. He is the wonderful counselor. Hebrews 4 tells us we can go boldly to the throne of grace. In biblical times, you had to be called into the throne room and the king had to hold out the royal scepter to grant you permission to come near him. We don't have to do that. Jesus says we can go boldly into his presence to ask for wisdom. He wants to give us wisdom this morning. Philippians 4 tells us that we can be sure he's listening because he told us to pray to him about our worries. So this morning, as you listen to this message, let your heart be open to the wisdom of God, and may you leave here this morning with a renewed hope that you can find all that you need and all the answers that you need in the wisdom of God. Amen. 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 How many of you love Isaiah 9, verse 6? Yeah. Many have considered that to be the centerpiece of all Christmas prophecies. And so this morning, we want to get into that a little bit deeper. Thank you, Pastor Lisa, for introducing the theme of counsel. Let me ask you this morning, if you were to seek out advice in different areas, whatever it might be, looking for wisdom, looking for guidance, looking for um, how to develop an excellence in a particular uh, field, who would you like to sit down with besides Pastor Richard? <laughs> and obviously besides Jesus. If it was in the area of finances, who would you like to sit down with to have a little counsel? Might, some of you might say Warren Buffett. Maybe if you were intrigued or interested in politics, it might be George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, or Ronald Reagan. Maybe you are an entrepreneur and you have some creative ideas and the creative juices flow. As far as creative genius, you might want to sit down with Elon Musk. Or maybe in ministry, you might be interested and want to speak with some of the uh, princes of preachers in history such as Charles Spurgeon or Billy Graham or some of you just learned about Smith Wigglesworth. <laughs> I found it very interesting that some of these people for charitable purposes will set up a lunch with you but you better bring your checkbook and you better bring a lot of money. On average in the past Warren Buffett has, for charity's sake, he has auctioned off uh, a luncheon uh, sit-down with himself. And it usually run fifty, dollars $100,000. But a, I think it was a couple of years ago, again for charity, they auctioned off a luncheon with Warren Buffett, who was considered a financial whiz, a genius. And the going rate, so, and again, it was for charity, and this was a billionaire. He paid $19 million to have lunch with Warren Buffett. If you have that kind of money, why do you need to talk to him about finances, right? <laughs> but there's a difference this morning. We understand that you can have knowledge, but not necessarily have wisdom. You can have a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a doctorate degree, and not necessarily be wise. I want you to understand this morning, knowledge is just an accumulation of facts and information and skills, maybe through education or experience. But wisdom is the right application of that knowledge. Wisdom is that experience and knowledge and good judgment put together. The Bible talks a lot about wisdom. Matter of fact, in Proverbs chapter 8, wisdom is personified. And what I mean by that, it is spoken of as a person. I, wisdom, call out. And Jesus really, prophetically, many scholars believe that in Proverbs chapter 8, it's really Jesus because it bears all the characteristics of divinity. Jesus is 
wisdom. This morning we're talking about Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 and 7 that he would be a wonderful counselor. He would be an advisor. And when he uses names, we know that when, when God or when characters in the Bible have a name, it usually is descriptive of their character or their nature. When we see Jesus, we understand he's the mighty God. He's the wonderful counselor. He's the prince of peace. He's the everlasting father. He's the wonderful counselor. I want you to turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. I have several verses of scripture. As you know, as your pastor, I love the word of God. I memorize the word of God. I have had the same Bible for 30 something years. Had to have it rebound and I've gotten a new Bible now. My main concern was I wanted a Bible that had the same layout. Because I remember things first, second, third or fourth column. And I love reading the word, looking up the word, meditating upon the word. Because the Bible says the entrance of your word gives light, it gives wisdom, it gives revelation. Look what the word of God says about Jesus, Colossians chapter 2. This is important. You're not going to necessarily get this Snapchat, TikTok, or social media necessarily, depending on what kind of feeds you have. Beware. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. According to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of this world, and not according to Christ. For in him, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principalities and powers. Isn't that a wonderful scripture? Isn't that an awesome scripture this morning? Jesus, we find our completeness in him. You and I might not be able to sit down with Warren Buffett, Tom Brady, Abraham Lincoln, Elon Musk, Billy Graham, Nelson Mandela. We might not be able to sit down with them, but we can sit down with the one who's created them all. Who's greater, the creation or the creator? The creator is greater. Jesus will provide information, but he will also provide counsel and wisdom for you and I to keep us spiritually on track you know there used to be a time when we would travel and we would get a map quest but even before I mean it wasn't the map quest the one you printed up online but even before then there was the flip pages from AAA the flip the flip maps you you'd have to follow it and then as soon as you see an exit you're about to take and you get down to the bottom you'd flip it and you would you would follow the directions from from Maine to Florida or wherever you were traveling and then we got a little bit more sophisticated we had map quest you could just put it in it all comes down on one page now we have what's called GPS GPS helps is, is a global uh, positioning system that helps to direct us when we travel. But you know what a key thing is? You have to put in your current location. You know, you have to know where you are to know where you're going. Right. And you see, the good thing about it is we all have vision, we all have dreams, we all want to get somewhere. But that's half the battle, really. You need to know where you are right now before yeah. you can get there. Let me, let me switch it a little bit. How about when you go into a hotel, you close the door, and you see on the back of that door a map uh, that gives you a way of escape in case of a fire, in case of some emergency. And it gives you the escape route. But you know what's key? You know what's critical? They always have a red dot. What's that red dot? Where you are here. You are here. And that is so you know where you're going. The uh, funny thing, I was with my wife uh, a few months ago in a, in a, 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 a retreat, a, path, a minister's conference for a, a couple of days. And this, this hotel was so big and it had in the middle of it a, like a, a, a play, a, a pool, kids area. And it was just massive. And sometimes I got a little confused and I was just walking back to my room and I saw a friend. I said, I said am I going the right way? He said, Matt, it, it depends where you're going. <laughs> and I said, that'll preach, that'll preach a sermon. It really depends where you go, but also depends where you're at. We need to know where we're at. And here's where spending time with Jesus personally, he's a wonderful counselor. 
Think about it. We get to sit with the creator of the universe, creator of it all, and he knows the beginning from the end, the end from the beginning. We get to sit with him and get counsel from someone who is the wisest of all times. Turn with me to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. This is in the gospel uh, time of Jesus with his disciples. And he always, um, he, he spent time with the disciples, but he had a, a favorite place to go. I don't know if it was the cooking. I don't know if it was the fellowship. But he liked to go over Mary and Martha's house. Now it happened as they went, he entered a certain village. Uh, verse 38, Luke chapter 10. He entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. Martha, Martha. When you say that twice, you know you're in trouble, right? You are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that part which will not be taken away from her. Just to set the context, here's Mary and Martha, two sisters. Jesus is welcome into a uh, uh, their home. But how many of you know when Jesus uh, went places, he went with his disciples. Right. So when, when he went into a home, there was going to be uh, a meal, and there was not just going to be one, you, you're cooking for a dozen or so. So there was a lot of work, right? And two sisters, same home, two different perspectives, you know, and, and sometimes those of you that have been around the church, you know this passage of scripture, you might fall into the category of being a Martha, yeah. which means you're a worker. You, you serve, uh, you, you know, you're, you're, you get things done. And some of you might fall into the category of being a, a Mary that sits at the feet of Jesus. Now, you know what I found? Uh, I found some church people, they defend Martha and they defend Mary. Right? right? Some, some, well, you know what? Something's going to get done around here. You can't just sit around and pray all the time. Somebody's going to cook. Somebody's going to do some work in the church. Somebody's going to do some ministry. And then the Mary say, well, we've got to seek the Lord. God wants us to pray all the time. How many of you know you need both? You need a Mary and you need a Martha. But you know what Jesus said? I think it's the key. said, Mary has chosen. She made a choice to sit at the feet of Jesus. You and I have a choice in our lives where we're going to sit where we're going to get our information, where we're going to get our counsel, where we're going to get our wisdom. Are we going to get it from the place in the world? Or are we going to get it from Jesus? Mary chose that part. She made a decision. I want to ask you this morning, the choices, what choices are you making in life? The choices you make determine your destiny. They, they might start off simple choices, but you know what? The choices you make begin to uh, chart the course for your life. Mary, she chose to sit at the feet of Jesus and what? Hear his counsel. Hear his word. I hope when it came for cleaning up the dishes afterwards, she was helping mom. <laughs> but the choice, do you choose in, in, in life, in ministry, in finances, in marriage, in singleness, whatever it is, family matters, Timing, we need wisdom in those areas. We need to know and understand, even in, the, even in the will of God, something might be the will of God, but it might not be the timing. Amen. Do you know that that's critical? You know there are some people that have messed up their, their lives in some ways, and even their ministry, because they didn't understand the difference between being something being God's will, but, but maybe not His timing. You know, if I looked at some things in my life in ministry and, and, and I knew the will of God, but I got frustrated in the process because it wasn't timing. Sometimes timing was years. Sometimes timing was, was not according to my timetable. God had a different plan, but I had to submit to that. And we need to know the will of God, but we also need to know the timing of God. You know what I found? Sometimes we can be very slick. 
as Christians. Very clever. When we want to do something, we'll find scriptural support to back that up. We'll find that the signs that we see confirm what we want to do. There was a man who, who had a big farm and he was he was he, he had this, this farm and 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 and, and was his livelihood and you know he was working it a little bit but but then he felt like God wanted him to go, go and preach and that's a good thing. And so so instead of taking care of his farm he just wanted to go preach. And so all he was looking for was a confirmation of that. So he saw a sign up in the heavens. It said GP. He said, that's the sign. Go preach. He went and preached. Failed miserably. Lost everything. And then he finally went back to God. And he really prayed and said, God, what is your will? What were you trying to show me? He said, God said to him, I said, go plow. <laughs> You see, a lot of times we can live frustrated when we lack the wisdom. But Jesus gives us opportunity to sit at his feet. Many times in life there are decisions. And you know what? Sometimes we get proud. We think we know. We think we can handle it. Sometimes the decisions might be seemingly small. Sometimes the decisions could be of greater consequence. But it's important that we seek God. We see God in prayer, we see God in his word, and we also see godly counsel. Turn with me to, to 2 Samuel. I want to read a passage of scripture that's very intriguing. 2 Samuel chapter 6. How many of you are still with me? Amen. Most of you. This is King David. This is the man who had a heart after God. He was... A king who the Bible says in Acts that when David had fulfilled and done the will of God, he slept with his fathers. Now that's, now if you want an epitaph, if you want something on your tombstone, I did the will of God and I slept. <laughs> to do all of the will of God is the most critical thing. Well, here's David. He has a desire. He is being um, beginning to be established in the kingdom. As the king, he's in Jerusalem, but something's lacking. The Ark of God. Now, the Ark of God is not Noah's Ark. The Ark of God was a chest, was a, a box, uh, three or four feet by a couple of feet or so. This was where the presence of God dwelt. This was the Ark of the Covenant. And so in that time, that was a place where God's presence would be manifested. So the Ark of the Covenant had not been brought to Jerusalem yet. So David had a good idea. He had a, 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 a very well-pleasing idea before God. A noble thought to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the political cap capital. But he wanted it to be the religious capital because God, David had a heart after God. He loved God with all his heart. And, and he wanted the presence of God to be in Jerusalem. Let's read 2 uh, Samuel. 2 Samuel, it says, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal, Judah, to bring up from the, there the ark of God, whose Name is called by the name, the Lord of hosts who dwells between the cherubim. So they set the ark of God on a new cart. Underline new in your Bible. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, not Federal Hill. And Uzzah in Ohio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which is on the hill, accompanying the ark of God in Ohio, uh, uh, hi. Oh, <laughs> went before the ark. Then David, listen, and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord. All kinds of instruments made of fir wood, on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on sistrums, and on cymbals. And when they came to Nathan's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to, to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. 
Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error, and he died there by the ark of God. David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David, but David took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months, and the Lord blessed Odin, uh, Obed-Edom in all his house. Now, look, let's look at this. David, the man of God, has a, a great desire in his heart to take the ark of the covenant, this, this chest that was overlaid with gold, cherubim, where the presence of God would, would, would manifest himself, uh, such a significant, the most uh, precious and most significant piece of furniture uh, that the children of Israel had because it was put in the, in the, in, in the tabernacle and it was very critical. So, so he, he's going to bring it to the city of Jerusalem. So, so he does some celebrating and, and the Bible says he brings it back on a new car. I ask you to highlight that or make note of that because it was a new car and we're going to see something that something was, wasn't quite right about that. But what happens is, as they have this cart on the ox, they have this, this the ox on this uh, oxen, the oxen stumbles, so here is Uzzah, he reaches out to steady it. Now that doesn't look like a bad idea. I mean, here's the ox of the covenant, it's going to fall over. I mean, that's like, it's not a good thing. He reaches out his hand and God strikes him and kills him. And David gets angry. Now you holy saints this morning, that don't get angry, I don't think we should get angry and you know, complain a little bit. Here's, here's a pat. David got mad. He was angry, God. God, what in the world? Why did you do this? I know you're so holy, you never did that. You never questioned God. But he was so angry, he said, you know what? Take the ark, let it go to Obed Edom's house. And you know what? The ark went, and you know where the ark of the covenant was, there was blessing. The Bible says that everything, another passage of scripture, that everything that Obed Edom had was blessed. His whole family, his whole life, because it represented the presence of God. Okay, so, so what's my point? What am I trying to say? Go over with me uh, to um, Second, uh, no, First Chronicles, First Chronicles chapter 15. First Chronicles chapter 15. Now, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Chronicles, um, written different perspectives, but many times the same stories. But here's a different perspective. First Chronicles chapter 15, David built houses for himself in the city of David, and he prepared a place for the ark of God. Right? That's what we're talking about. He pitched a tent for it. Then David said, no one may carry the ark of God but the Levites. For the Lord has chosen them, them to carry the ark of God and to minister before him forever. And David gathered all Israel together at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of God to its place, which he had prepared for it. Down to verse 12. Then he said to them, you are the heads of your father's houses. You are the heads of the father's houses of the Levites. Sanctify yourself, you and your brethren, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel to the place I have prepared for it. Look at verse 13. I want you to get this. I want you to highlight this in your Bible. For because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult, consult him about the proper order. What Uzzah did, how they brought up the ark on a new, car, a new cart, they didn't do it the prescribed way, they didn't do it the right order. You had Uzzah who, who uh, presumed to study the ark like he was going to help God or help the situation. God struck him. There's a period of time that goes by and David begins to seek counsel. He begins to seek the word. <coughs> He begins to process what happened. And you know what he learns? He learns we didn't do it in the right order. We didn't follow the steps that God prescribed in his word. 
See, it wasn't supposed to be on a cart. There were actually hoops at the end uh, of, the, of the base, and they would have put poles through it, and the Levites would have carried it. Not to touch it, not to be near it. No hands would have touched it, because it was holy. And they would have carried a prescribed way. But the Bible says, we did not consult him about the proper order. Wow. Think about it. God's prescribed way. It's so critical, brothers and sisters, this morning, that we understand that God has a proper order. God has a prescribed way about life, about marriage, about ministry, about our finances. God has a prescribed order. It's not enough just to know. We, we really, we, we must obey what God says. There is a proper order. How many in our culture, how many in our world, how many even in the church are, are not following the prescribed order? There's a prescribed order for marriage. You don't live together. You don't have sex before marriage and then get married. There's a proper order. You get married first. I don't know if I'm preaching to the, to the heathen, to the unsaved. But isn't that the truth? There's a prescribed order. And, and I have found, I've been in pastoral ministry enough to see there's been a decline, there's been an erosion of morals, even in the church, where it used to be when I counseled people that wanted to get married, that I would sit in my office and, 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 and seven or eight uh, out of ten of them were not already ma living together, not already having children, not already bought a home together. They're not even married, but they got a home together. They're not even married, but they're sleeping together. They're not even married, but they got children. Oh my Lord, it's getting quiet in here, but, but Holy Spirit, help people this morning. Get a revelation. All right, I, I, I believe in grace. You can't unscramble an egg, but God will help you to make a nice omelet out of it. If you obey Him, if you trust Him, if you do the proper order now, not tomorrow, not next year. Right now, repent now. Do what's right before God now. Amen. There is a proper order. You know, statistics show those people, couples who live together, co-inhabit before they get married, have a higher percentage of divorce afterwards. Let's just think of it logically, not even biblically. Let's think of it logically. You know when you're telling somebody that you're not willing to be married legally, you're telling them, I'll live with you until I can find something better. But they, they got you beat too because they're thinking the same thing. If I can some find a, somebody better than you, you're out the door, sucker. There's no commitment. There's no commitment. We didn't do it. What did David say? God struck a man. Now, God doesn't do that today. But let me tell you, some people get struck down spiritually. They, they die inside. When you continue to disobey God, do things out of order, do things the wrong way, you begin to die. You begin to move away from the, where God has for you. But I'm just trying to encourage you to do it the proper way. You don't try to do, you don't get the order wrong. You don't try to do big things for God without doing little things for God. Hello? Jesus said, he who is faithful in little will be faithful in much. You don't spend all your money and then give God your leftovers. That's out of order. You honor the Lord with the first fruits of all your possessions. Praise the Lord. I'm so thankful I'm preaching the word this morning. I don't need your affirmation. It's nice to have an amen. Um, but I don't need it this morning because this is the word of God. I feel strong. I feel because we need to understand that there's a proper order. David came to the realization. He said, we didn't consult him about the proper order. We didn't consult God about the direction, about how we're to live our lives. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, I understand something, you know, in my life. I've grown up in the things of God to know that I've got to pray. I've got to seek the word of God. I've got to seek godly counsel. It used to be a time where couples were looking to get married. Uh, before they even made plans, they would talk to a pastor. I'm just trying to help you this morning. If maybe if you didn't know this, I'm going to give you a bye. But from this day forward, there's something about 
spiritual authority. Not that we dictate your life, not that we make decisions for you, but we're counsel and advice so that you could you could know and, and, and have a confirmation of the will of God. See, the way I know I was married many, many years ago, some of you weren't even born back in 1991. But you see, when it came to, to dating Pastor Lisa, I prayed and fasted. I wanted to know that I know that I know it's God's will because you know what? In life, I don't care who you marry. I don't care what ministry you're in. I don't care what job you have. If you don't, if you don't know God's will, it'll be so easy to be moved out of that. Because life is hard. Marriage is hard. Ministry is hard. If I didn't know that I know that I know that I know, I wouldn't be here today. The devil would have taken me out already. But I know that I know that I know that I can stand strong because if God has me where he wants me, he will sustain me. He'll give me the grace. But what I did was I, I, I went with Pastor Lisa to meet my pastor. I needed to get my pastor's approval. Again, not because he was controlling, not because he, he wanted to make decisions, because I, I had respect for pastoral authority. Yeah. Now, you see, you've got to understand, when I grew up and my pastor knew me very well, and I was on fire for God. So, so at the church, I was like he, I was like a golden boy. I was like the golden boy. I'm just telling you, I'm not, just, just giving you the facts. So he wanted to make sure, who is this girl? Does she measure up? And listen, I do the same thing for the people in our church. If you're a part of this church and you're and, and, and loving God and serving God, you're, you're special to me. If some guy comes along, I want to I wanna make sure he's good for you. Some girl comes along, I want to make sure she's good for you. But let me tell you, good looks are good, but, but, but that good looking guy in six months or a year and a half could be laying on the couch unshaven, not, not wanting to get a job, not want to do any work, and all of a sudden those hearts that you saw all around you, they start to poof and disappear, and reality hits you. So, so my wife and I, oh, well, well, my wife to be a were you my fiance? <laughs> so, so we went to my pastor's home. And my pastor, you know, God bless him. Uh, Lisa left that house. She said, I don't, I don't want to ever go back to that house. And she, my pastor drilled her. Like wanted to make sure. Do you, are you counting the cost? Do you understand uh, Richard has a call of God in his life? Ministry and, and he's on fire for God. He wants to serve. Are you, are you able to... To, to drink the cup. <laughs> you know, could have got offended and I'm not going to go back to my pastor. I'm going to go to find another pastor. I know none of you have ever thought of that or done that, but I love you anyhow. I'm just trying to give you wisdom this morning. Jesus is a wonderful counselor, but he uses leadership. He uses people as a, as a covering, as a blessing, as, as a security. What, what kind of affirmation it is to have a pastor and leader say, yes, I, I, I feel good about this. Yes, I give my blessing. You know how good that feels? Yes. You could. <laughs> We're talking about counsel this morning. We're talking about the wonderful counsel of Jesus. We're talking about the word of God. We're talking about the direction that God gives in our life to show us that we might know his will and that we might follow it and we might do it the proper order. What happened when David did it the proper way? I'm not going to take time to read all the scriptures, but the Bible says that there was dancing, there was rejoicing, there was such a sense of relief and peace that we did it the right way. Amen. Let me just say to you this morning, God, God loves you. God, God wants to see you prosper. God wants to see you do well in life, but you've got to do it the proper way. And there's good news. If you made mistakes, God is so good. He's so faithful. You can move forward today and you can see God begin to restore your life. But you know what the an issue is, and I close with this. It's, it's one thing to know the will of God. It's another thing to want to do it. Jesus said when he was preaching, he said, if you want to know my doctrine, if you really want to know it, you better, are you willing to obey it? He said, if you're willing, then you'll know. Do you know that revelation comes when you, when you obey? Yes. Yes. 
great revelation comes when you obey. The more you obey God, you can sit in a church for 20, 30 years, be under some of the greatest preaching and teaching. But if you don't obey, instead of a softening, a hardening can take place. Mm -hmm. Instead of a growth and maturity, if anything, you could be stunted in your growth. But you have to understand, it's not enough just to know, you have to obey. Take the prophecies concerning the first coming of Jesus. You know the story. Wise men. They were astronomers. They were philosophers. They were the educated of their day. They had seen a star. They had followed a star. They came from the east. Some say it could have been 800 miles or more. They traveled at a slow, slow pace. They didn't have jets. They didn't have the transportation system we have today. They had to travel by by some animal, a donkey, a horse, or whatever. But they came, and the Bible says they came to Jerusalem. And they, they, they met with Herod, King Herod, and they asked, they said, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? And you know what, you know what Herod did? He called for, the, for those who, who studied the law. He called for the scribes. He called for the ones who, who would know. And you know what they said? They came to, in the scroll, in, in, in the book of uh, Micah, that says about the Christ child being born in Bethlehem. They knew the word of God. They knew where he would be born. And you know what? The saddest thing was, they didn't lift a finger. They didn't take a step. They didn't make a move to follow that truth. Here there were the wise men, maybe travel several weeks and months, 800 or more miles, and here from Jerusalem to, to Bethlehem was just a short journey of, of maybe 20, 25 miles. They didn't lift a finger, they didn't take a step, they didn't move, because you have to understand, it's not enough to hear, it's not enough to know what the right thing to do, you have to have true wisdom. True wisdom is the application of knowledge, the right application, actually living out what you know to be true. This morning, we have to understand when we get wisdom, when we hear the word of God preached, when we get counsel from those that are older and wiser. You know, you can get counsel from somebody. They don't even have to be older. Sometimes they've just been a little further along in the journey than you have. They know some of the pitfalls. They know some of the dangers. They know some of the stumbling blocks. And they also know the stepping stones. And it's, and it's important that we, we learn and we grow and we get godly wisdom. But, but you have to apply it. You have to apply it. And you know what really troubles, uh, uh, troubles me when I see people who have such pride that they won't respond. No, I can do it my own way. I have my own order. No, there is a proper order. There is a right order. And I'm not saying it from me, I'm saying it from the authority of the scriptures, the authority of God's word. You know what keeps us, you know what holds us back is pride. No one's going to tell me what to do. I'm not willing to humble myself and acknowledge that I made mistakes. Maybe because it was the way you were brought up. You never knew how to uh, handle failure. You, 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 you just don't know how to deal with it. And, and, and see, pride could get in any of us and all of us. Matter of fact, some of us, when God does use us, and when God does open doors, and God does bless our lives, pride could easily creep in there and think, we've got all the answers now. You know what I've learned in life, I might not have all the great ideas or all the right answers, but I've learned enough to be able to discern good ideas and great advice. So you don't have to have all the answers, you just need to have the discernment, the Holy Spirit discernment to be able to know what to accept, what to reject, what to take, what to leave behind. May the Holy Spirit help us this morning. I'm going to ask the singers and musicians to come back so that we can end with a song and with a prayer this morning. Counsel from Jesus. Counsel from Jesus. Wonderful counsel. To sit at the feet of Jesus this morning. To say, God, what is your will? God, what is your direction? God, show me if I've gotten things out of order today. If I've taken the wrong steps, Lord, let me reorder my steps. Let me reprioritize my life today. Can we stand together this morning? Praise the Lord.
wonderful counselor. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him. You know, another person doesn't make us complete. God makes us complete. That's right. yes. But when we meet that right person, we're in that right relationship, whether it's in a, a marriage, whether it's in a church, whether it's in relationships and ministry, then there's, there's a special blessing when God is in the right order. We didn't do it the right way, he said. David was humble enough after he processed his anger and his grief and his whatever he had to go through. He says, you know what? Let's do it the right way. No new car, no doing it our way, no, no doing it out of order. Let's, let's do it the prescribed way. I don't know what the Holy Spirit is trying to speak to some of you. I couldn't even begin to imagine what, what God could do with the Word of God today and speak to your situation. But I do believe the Holy Spirit wants you to know during the Christmas season that there is counsel. There is wisdom. There is something fresh from the Word of God, from the presence of God, to take you places you've never been before. This morning, I want us to worship with a song. If you feel led to come and pray, maybe kneel at your seat. Maybe you need to evaluate and examine your heart. Let the Holy Spirit do that. You know, I don't trust my own heart because the Bible says that the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Who could know it? Only the Lord knows our heart. And he'll reveal things to us and he'll show us things and he'll, he'll renew our minds and he'll help us to re, readjust and refocus today. But as they begin to sing, if you want to come and find a place of prayer, you want to kneel at your seat, maybe you need to ask the Lord for the proper order. What's the proper order? What, what did I get out of my let me get Let me get this thing right. Let me tell you, God is for you this morning. He's not against you. He's for you. God wants to see you succeed. He wants us to prosper and be in health, even as our soul prospers. But what needs to prosper first is our soul, our spiritual part of us. So as they begin to sing, if you find a place to pray, then we're going to dismiss in five minutes. But let's sing one chorus of worship. Let's turn our heart to God today. Whatever God is trying to speak to us, we seal it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Savior, I come, quiet my soul.
course to the cross because we know it's in the cross where our past is dealt with, where we're given a future and a hope. Lord, I just pray every heart, every mind, influenced by your word, God, may in some way, may we all draw a little bit closer to you yes. in fellowship and togetherness and communion with you, God. Lord, I pray your blessing, God, upon the word, the worship, every aspect of today. May our hearts be full. Yeah. God, even if we've been challenged, even if we felt a little convicted, God, we know that's a good thing because conviction pulls us away from the pit, pulls us away from the wrong direction, yeah. and ultimately yeah. leads to destruction. We thank you. We pray your blessing. We pray our responsive hearts today. We pray a blessing on this Christmas season. Yes. Let Christ truly be the joy and the peace of our lives. And may that spill over into other people's lives. Yes. Lord, we thank you. We praise you today. In Jesus' name.